Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. General Deptula, appreciate the uh, opportunity, the forum, the first one of its kind to be able to get the message out to folks about what is our strategy, what is our force design, how are we using it? I think it's all good stuff. I, listening to the panels earlier, and really I think they wrapped up my entire speech, so what, what are your questions? No, they really did a wonderful job. They, uh, we, we've been discussing this a lot internally. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I was Dave Harris, director of uh, A57, so it's strategy, integration, and requirements. Uh, before that, I was the DC fact for a year, and then before that, I had General Kunkel's job working the uh, force design, integration, and uh, part of the requirements in wargaming. So what you don't know about me <clears throat> is uh, I've had 13 deployments, four one-year deployments. It's because I haven't figured this out yet, so I figure they keep sending me back until I can get it right and learn from it. So one of the things I did during the deployments, because I now know I have the coveted lunchtime schedule with all of you, is uh, so one of my deployments, I decided I would do a, uh, a climate survey, which by the way, when you're deployed, you're really not supposed to do a climate survey because of the rotation of people, but I did one anyway. So as they go through this and they start discussing a little bit about how the health, morale, and welfare of your unit's doing, I. Uh, you know, I went immediately to the words, you know, when they, when they write words about you and what are the issues. So I got halfway through to the bottom of the page and it said, if I had three minutes on this earth, I'd want to spend it with Colonel Harris. And I stopped and I went, oh my God, I made an, made an impact on an airman. And I flipped the page and it said, because Colonel Harris would drone on and on and on and make those three minutes feel like a lifetime. Just setting the tone for what type of speaker you're going to get here for the next couple of minutes. But hopefully the next few minutes uh, won't feel like a lifetime for you. We're going to talk a little bit about the connection to strategy, to design, what we're doing with design, and more specifically, what is our design? So as I was out running this morning, it was pretty cold and I really only ran so I don't look like a Build-A-Bear in a flight suit. But I'm thinking about this going, you know, what am I going to talk about? How do I start talking about this connection from strategy to design? So on the strategy part, I was thinking about businesses, some of the businesses that were in the room. And I remember going through the, uh, the booklet, seeing all the different industries that are relevant here today and, and who's representing and the allies and partners. And, and uh, it got me thinking, you know, 15 years ago, how are the companies that are in this room still in this room? And it, and it dawned on me, you know, they, I know they did not plan for some of the obstacles and some of the threats that are out there. They had their core missions. They know what their business model is. And it seems like DOD goes in there and flips it upside down on their head every time they turn around. But thinking about it a little bit more, these companies, all of you that are in the room today, you know, you had to fight through things like COVID. I'm sure you didn't plan for that. And if you did plan for it, please send me that person because we could really use them at the A57. But, you know, for COVID, companies were investing in the digital infrastructure. They went to a hybrid work model. They adapted. They started thinking about climate change over the past 15 years. There were things like the Paris Agreement, uh, the EU uh, Green Deal. They started thinking more about some of the regulations and some of the, uh, the sanctions that would happen. They invested into alternative energy sources, uh, things like that. They adapted. They overcame that challenge. The other thing they did is they saw the rise in social and political tensions that were happening. They were already invested in diversity and inclusion, but they now use this to build social responsibility and trust in their brand and manufacturing. So these are companies that were successful. But then as I turned the corner to make the run back to the house, I was thinking, you know, there's probably companies out there that didn't do as well as the companies that are in this room. In 2013, Apple had an opportunity to invest in Tesla and didn't. Microsoft and Yahoo had an opportunity to invest in Google. All these things that happened, what they did is they were focused on a structured governance board with stale strategy. They weren't able to kind of see the, the forest through the trees. So I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, man, it's a rough time to be a strategist. I feel like today's strategist, it's like living during an earthquake, and you're trying to hold a glass of water still. You know, parts of the floor are falling off underneath you, parts of the ceiling are collapsing in on you. So what do you focus in on? If you focus in on the wrong thing, you become the, those companies that missed out on, on Googles and, and, uh, and Teslas. But, but if you focus in on the right things, what you do is you, you scan the horizon, you see where this discussion is going, you see where the environment's going, you see where the changing character of war is going to be able to adapt yourself, restructure yourself to make sure you're positioned in, in the next generation environment. 
This is just double tapping a little bit of and putting some context into what the chief was talking about, about the changing character of war. When we first started writing a little bit of the changing or the, uh, the force design, I had in there in accordance with the NDS, NDS priorities, NDS key operational problems. And the first thing I was told to do was take out the NDS because the force design needs to be a bit more enduring. And if the NDS changes, does that mean your force design changes? No, because the changing character of war is really what we're looking at. We're looking at those trends. My goal would be to keep that force design the same so we're not moving the goalpost for investments and we're not moving the goalpost on what it takes to win unless there's a change in strategy, a change in technology, or a huge change in the threat. And those are the things that the team looks at. And it's not just the team here, but it's all the MAGCOMs. It's the rest of the director or deputy chiefs of staff that are on there. And we meet on this and discuss routinely about where we are. So there's an assessment piece that has to be incorporated into all of it. One of the things, uh, going back to the Mitchell Institute, <clears throat> we do a lot of learning through war gaming. War games will give you a point of view. And when you run enough of them, trends start to bubble up. So we ran one with the uh, Mitchell Institute and it was on the collaborative combat aircraft. And this had probably been our fourth or fifth one <clears throat> that we had run. But every time we run it, we find something a little bit different. And somebody asked a question before about the, you know, the human performance piece. <clears throat> well, you know, there's a human machine teaming piece to the collaborative combat aircraft as well. And how are we looking at the workload on the pilot? When can we offboard some of that onto the collaborative combat aircraft? And it should know before you start realizing that you're being task saturated. So there has to be this connectivity. And by the way, I would hope that link that's doing this is pretty secure as well. The last thing I would want is the adversary being able to exploit that link to know that the pilot's fatigued or the autonomy platform is doing more autonomy than it's supposed to. But, but those are things that when I start looking at stuff and I think about things, <clears throat> a lot of these connections start coming together and they come together in a very meaningful way. To me, that's through the force design. So you heard me talk a little bit about the strategy piece and why the strategy is important. Because when you go back to those companies and the things that I was just talking about, it's about choices. Some companies made better choices than other companies. Our strategy lays out choices that we need to make. And the force design to me is a rubric or a framework for thinking about how to make those choices. So let me unpack a little bit of the work that I've done and then now that General Kunkel has done on the force design. So to me, when I first started, you know, it, the, the first couple of times we tried with the force design, it, 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 was, it landed terribly. We did, here's the Air Force you need, here's the Air Force you don't need. Tell me what MAGCOMs would come after you with that kind of red-blue chart, all of them. We also did a table of forces. This is all the platforms we have. These are all the capabilities. These are all the new capabilities. This is how many you need, threshold, objective. Well, that's not really a design. That's a force structure. So there's a difference between a design and a force structure. You can have multiple designs, but still get to that north star of what you're trying to get to in a design, which only made the design that much more complicated to try to articulate. So the way that we've now described it, and I'm gonna to try to visually paint you a picture of, of, of what this looks like. So first off, the design takes into account three different things. One is homeland defense, strategic deterrence, and power projection. And I know for uh, whoever introduced me said China, 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 but notice that I did not say China, China, China. In some of those power projection scenarios, the capacities vary, and the stressing case may not be in China, it may be somewhere so those are the things that we want to take into account, part of the capacity problem. Other places, I have a capacity and a capability problem. So now this thing is starting to come into shape, and we start to understand a little bit more. So let's, let, let's take a dry run through this. So if I have homeland defense, strategic deterrence, and I have power projection, and those become your, I'll just call them vertical stovepipes, using a, a poor analogy. The horizontal cross-cutting pieces are what capabilities do I need? What are the people and the capacity of that that I need? Because you want the right people coming out when the capability meets as well. And then where I put those capabilities matter. It's deterrence. So that's kind of the framework for I, how I think about the force design. We had General Kunkel come in and we sat down at the marker board and we, we go to the fighter bar and we argue over a whole lot of different drawings and diagrams and erase them and we redraw them again. And the best one that we came up with and I'm going to put a little bit more fidelity to it, was one the chief showed earlier, and it had to do with the mission areas, but here's how we got to it. So if you have a vertical axis, your y-axis, it's your threat intensity, and your x-axis, I would just call it distance. But if you can, for a moment, just imagine a globe, unfolding the globe into a flat earth, 
and you start drawing what we think the threat intensity is starting with the homeland. And there's a little bit of threat there, cyber, uh, there could be other uh, nuclear threats, all sorts of different threats, but we draw what we think through analysis that threat intensity might look like. Then we come over to Europe, there might be a little bit of a bump uh, over the Russia-Ukraine, we go over CENTCOM, CVEO, but when you finally get to areas like Indo-KCOM, that threat intensity increases. It increases pretty high, and then it slowly dips down back to where you're back on the Pacific coast doing homeland defense again. So all that being said, <clears throat> what we used to do is we would take the highest threat level that was there, and that became the bar to what we would buy force structure. So everything had to be able to meet this threat intensity level. That is well beyond what we're capable of doing today. Plus what you do is you leave a lot on the table in the rest of the world that you end up with high-end platforms and you're burning life cycle out of them, and that's not efficient either. So there's an efficiency and effectiveness piece that we're discussing here with this force design. So as we're looking at this, I, I hate to use the word, I, I, and I won't use inside and outside, but what I will use is that mission area one. So if you take where the spike went up initially, the things that you have to do in this high density threat environment, they're very different than the things that you would have to do in a lower intensity conflict type. And, and there's a, there is a sharp curve or a, a greater distance in between those two. So the mission and the function of what that force would need to do is very different. I would argue for task and purpose, it probably needs to initially stop the spread of the threat. Two, it probably has to strike targets that it is designed to be able to strike and kill to be able to stop that threat. The other part is it has to be able to connect into the other two mission areas. This piece about domain awareness, battle space awareness, it's an important piece. And it's one where if you have something that's inside already and you will have forces inside, we have not given up on air superiority. Air, we are committed to doing air superiority. But when you have a threat that looks like us, but just bigger, doing air superiority the same way that we've done it in the past may not be the best way to do it. There's probably some other areas to look at how do you actually succeed in a highly dense threat environment. If you step back out there, the beauty of this is you, you don't just use mission area one to do mission area one things. Stop, go to your next phase, use mission area two to do mission area two things. All three of these are acting together. That's the power of this. This is where we need to be. The integration of all of those, you have to have ISR. All the core functions the chief showed up on that chart are still relevant. We have teams that are arrayed within the A57 that do the same thing. Your new integrated capabilities command, the joint capabilities areas will be focused on the same exact things that your A57 are. And all of them now have inputs from all the MAGCOMs. So with that said, the way that I kind of see the whole force design working is it has to be that rubric that helps you make fiscally informed decisions so I can see in the future the, uh, the A57 giving force design guidance. What are those capabilities we need and what does that portfolio look like? How much of mission area three, how much of mission area two, and how much of mission area one do you need at any given circumstance? So let me, let me just give you an example of how that might work. So I said before, the threat intensity kind of climbs over the Indo-PACOM area right now. Ongoing today, we have Israel with Lebanon, we have Hamas. What happens if Israel decides to do something with Iran? Then our benevolent dictator Putin decides he's gonna make a, a sweep through Ukraine and decide to maybe go a little bit further. I contend that there's another spike that we've just developed over that area. But what that mission area one force looks like and the things that you use inside, the systems that are used inside that would be different than the things that I would use probably for the Indo-PACOM scenario. They could be the same. But again, if you go back to the purpose and task, stop the spread of the threat, hit those targets that only they need to hit to be able to stop that spread and link in the other two forces, that mission area three force is critical. It's your war winning backbone of our Air Force. All the platforms that we have today need to look and just act a little bit differently. And I'm going to use a little bit of a page out of the Vice Chief's book. A lot of times when we take a look at strategy and we're trying to figure out what to do, we have a team that takes a look at some competitive assessments. We'll take a look at U.S. versus another country. We'll take a look at the capability, well, the platforms they have, the capabilities, and we try to intuit where their strategy or what their strategy is. Based on the guidance we got, we come up with a counter strategy, and then we lay out what capabilities we think we need. Some of those capabilities we have today that exist within our Air Force. Others 
with just a little bit of modification, I could really make that capability relevant in a mission area two, or even more relevant in three, possibly even one. All of these things coming together. There's some capabilities that require a clean sheet, whole new concept, and it's a brand new platform, system, weapon, software, whatever it is. All those things have to be brought to bear, and those are the things we end up putting into the into the force design. So I think about it almost like the way you would look at the mutual fund uh, circles with how much investment is in each, and each one of those spikes have a different proportion or ratio into it. So these are the assessments that are ongoing. By the way, this force design has to be a living document. The world changes, threats change, technology changes, there could be a better way of doing it. So all of that stuff has to be fed back in. Those are the things that our team continually looks at, and I think your new integrated capabilities command will take lead on developing a lot of those war winning capabilities as well. So I know we're a little bit uh, behind schedule on this one and I wanted to leave time for questions. I think some of the discussion that we've had to date, we've talked more theoretical about what the force design is. What I wanna leave you with is, one, when time comes, our force will fight. We have to fight. It's a different type of environment than it was in the global war on terror. Two, it is my responsibility, the chief's responsibility, the Air Force's responsibility to make sure that we're getting war-winning capability out to our airmen. And the last part is all of these capabilities have to be integrated, not only across the joint force, but with the allies and partners. It takes all of us to do this. I was having a discussion with, uh, with Lucky, with Heather Penny, and it was about this whole idea of, <clears throat> okay, so where does all this stuff fit in? What are the platforms? What do they look like? You know, I, I, wanna get, I, I do want to get to platforms, but I think about platforms in terms of systems and the networking and putting together of those systems and, and pulling the pieces of space together and pulling the pieces of undersea warfare together and, and the multi-domain aspect of it. One of the things that we've, uh, we've been working on for probably the past three years is something called the Joint Long Range Kill Chain. And it initially started with uh, the A-570 Air Force and the Navy. We knew the Navy was doing a lot of work into this. We pulled the, uh, the Admiral, Admiral Khan, now Jimmy Pitts, into the conversation. And we started talking about, well, what does your long range kill chain look like? And, and I explained to him what ours looks like. And we ended up coming up with a graph. And if you remember the old uh, Price is Right game, they played this thing called Plinko. It almost looks like a Plinko chart of the different capabilities and when they would be ready. We put ours up and he finally put his up. We both kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we're both investing in the same stuff. How about we invest in your stuff here and you invest in our stuff there? And we quickly realized that we can't do this without the Space Force. So we brought the Space Force S58 in. And he was like, man, I'm glad you brought me into this because we were getting rid of this, this, and this. And boy, that would be bad for you when it came to the different capabilities you need. So how about we delay that a little bit more? So you can see that sometimes this is all happening bottom up, but there's an integrated piece of this. And how are we looking at the force design? And we're using those same principles about the mission areas to be able to help define what, what do we need a long range kill, kill chain for? How is it going to be used? What munitions, what platforms, how do you connect into it? How do we connect the Navy, the Army, the Space Force, and then the allies and, uh, pardon me, the partners into it as well? So I'll pause there. And uh, what I really want to do is turn it back over to you because I feel like a discussion about understanding a little bit more of the force design and where some of this may go is better through a conversation. So I think we have a few folks that are passing around some mics. So I'll stand by and take some questions from you. Thank you, General, for your comments. Uh, really helps our understanding of the, of the force design. Mark Hunsinger Mitchell. Um, <clears throat> he used the words fiscally informed. Uh, many, many years in OSD, we use those words all the time to explain why our budget was strategy informed, or fiscally informed, and so forth, so, which really meant budget constraints. Uh, could you speak to us about the force design? Is it are you really building a force design that you believe the Air Force can afford? Or is it also a way to explain this is the force America needs and then use that as a foundation to argue for the resources to build that? That's a good question. Here's how I would answer that. And first I would say that it, it really is fiscally informed, not constrained. 
So I think there is an A8 piece to this, right? But I can build you the world's best Air Force. We as a team can build the world's best Air Force. I'm here to tell you we probably can't afford it. But what you can do is if you constrain yourself to a point, you can actually develop the logic and the rationale to be able to go out there and either have the right narrative to be able to argue for the additional resources about why these systems need to come together. It's not good enough just to buy this one platform, but this platform is also connected to counter C5 ISRT, or I still need a little bit of base defense, and I still need a little bit of uh, refueling aspects of it. All these things together, if I just buy one element of that, I'm missing the boat. It's, it, it goes back to your comment earlier about the family of systems. You actually get more of a rigor, rigor in your argument when it's fiscally informed. Sir, Bill Conley, I am uh, to your left. You're looking, sorry, there we Thank go. Thank you. Um, so I'm a Chief Technology Officer, Mercury Systems, uh, recovered bureaucrat, and been out of the Pentagon for five years, therefore this, the big smile on my face. Um, as a CTO, I'm always looking for what are those disruptive technologies that are going to be the paradigm changing event, the you know transformation of the S curve. As you're doing the force design exercise, what are what are those disruptive things that you're you're pressure testing? No, so I so I think there's a there's a difference here. There's disruptive things, and but there's other things where it, as technology advances it's actually making the cost of something cheaper or giving me increased capability in something as well. So I'm going to use that as my, as my kneeboard for what, what disruptive may mean, right? So first I would tell you that counter C5 ISRT, what we're doing in the EW and the cyber spectrums, those things right there, there's, the technology is rapidly advancing. I think it's one of the reasons you see that the Air Force has gone to the warrant officer system. That career field in that area is ch rapidly changing to the point where you have to be at the tip of the spear to understand the latest change because those windows of opportunity open and close as fast as they do. So if that is disruptive tech, then I would tell you that the area of cyber and IT is one of the areas. Uh, while this is more on the Air Force futures piece of this, I would still tell you that space has to be one of the key pieces that we rest a lot of our one long range kill chain on. But a lot of our comms and architectures and the things that space provides to us. As we start looking at the adversaries that are around the world and everybody getting more space uh, aware, this domain awareness piece becomes more and more important and what I can do with it. And that also actually informs a lot of my requirements about what apertures do I need? What, how am I gonna communicate with other aircraft? So the space piece of this is, uh, is actually pretty interesting. The proliferated LEO, uh, the PLEO pieces of it, what we put on the systems, all those types of things. I think the technology in that area is rapidly advancing and changing, and I have to be able to keep pace, to be able to make sure I have the latest and greatest systems. By the way, all of these come with vulnerabilities. So how do I protect myself from all of it again? And I go back to the cyber and IT platforms of it. You know, when it comes to the power projection, I told you there were three parts of the force design, the homeland defense, strategic deterrence, and power projection. Uh, you, you can do power projection in a lot of different ways, but I'm here to tell you at the end of the day, a plane only has so much range and it can only have so many munitions on there. And at some point in time, I either have to land to get more fuel and more munitions, so I have to rearm, refit, refuel, or I can get that from a tanker. And as the threat continues to expand, uh, that ability to be able to have the maintainability in the aircraft, to be able to upload it at speed and scale, uh, that matters. And I think where that comes into a contributing uh, enabler is base defense or the point defense. And I think General Kashevsky talked a little bit about that earlier. And there's a lot of advances in that one when it comes to disruptive tech and the different forms in which you could take, whether it's kinetic or non-kinetic. So those are the ones that I think about. I'm sure there's others that are out there, but I think for right now, that's, that's probably top off. Thanks. Otis, I think everybody can hear you. So thanks, sir. Otis Winkler from Kratos. Just a quick question. It, you're talking about Mission Area 1 and being out of balance, potentially, on the forces that would be in Mission Area 1. What attributes are you looking for the Mission Area 1 system that you would need in order to rebalance the overall force? Yeah, yeah so the ones for the uh, that go into Mission Area 1, uh, you know, the, the chief hit onto him up there when he came to attributes, uh, the survivability piece. So we talked about lots of different ways to survive. One, you could be better connected. Two, we can talk about speed, high speeds, hypersonics, things like that. Uh, the other one is the ability to detect you. So uh, what you would want to see in Mission Area 1 is a, is a high survivability. There's also things that lower risk of force. I still want to be able to achieve the mission, 
but things like a collaborative combat aircraft is a great way of augmenting other, other platforms that are survivable to go in there for mass. And I won't use the word affordable mass because sometimes that gives the connotation that if I had more money, I would buy something different. And I'm still convinced that there is a knee in the curb in this piece about a high-low mix and what CCAs can provide. Uh, the others are the types of munitions that we're seeing out there. Uh, you do need the, the exquisite munitions, the things that are going to do the, uh, the hard hitting, and those come at a price point. But you do have the, the low-cost cruise missiles. You do have the other ones that are modular. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus more on the modularity piece of this, and I think that was talked about by Armo in one of the panels earlier. That's key, the ability to be able to take something and be able to, at one point, put electronic attack pieces on there, and at another point, put a warhead or another one, be able to talk from one munition to another. The ways that we can connect these different munitions in mass matters. And I think that gives us a competitive advantage as we start looking from the outside in. It also helps if you're already inside. Uh, let, me, let me give you another example. Here, here's another piece. Uh, just thinking about the Russia-Ukraine war and what's going on. You know, I was talking to uh, the Institute for the Study of War, and we were having a discussion about the amount of drones that are overhead. And at any given time, they, they started thinking about, I wonder if there's an air superiority difference at 5,000 feet and below versus 5,000 feet and above. And the argument they made, I thought, was pretty interesting. Because if we did it the old way, where you'd put a certain type of radar on a fighter, and the fighter then has two AIM-9s on there, and here we are spending a ridiculous amount of money killing a, a 3D printed you know, drone, but that drone was looking at you or armed, it could be deadly. You know, the cost of saving a life, invaluable, but look at the cost that it took to be able to do it. Is that the way that we want to do it? Or is there another type of disruptive tech piece that can be used inside that we can regenerate rapidly? It's low cost, but I can counter some of that threat that's in there. I think the, the battlefield and the landscape, the way we're looking at it, this speed of innovation, this, this elastic type of manufacturing that we're talking about, like that's a thing. It's something that I think other countries and big countries and bureaucracies have a hard time keeping up with. But the speed in which we can keep somebody on their heels, I think, is a competitive advantage for us. So that's a method in which we would use, I could easily see in a mission area one scenario. Gotcha. Afternoon, sir. Uh, I know as a University of Alabama grad, an education question is going to be right in your wheelhouse. So, uh, I'm going to throw this out there. Boy, I hope you got pictures. <laughs> uh, shifting it a little bit, in the force, in the force development uh, paradigm that you're presenting, it seems to me uh, airman adaptive thinking is one of the critical elements, as well as lower level direct engagement with industry. Do we think our ADC is going to handle that, or is that something that's high on your priority list? So I think ADC will handle a portion of it, but I also think Air Combat Command will handle another portion of it. So it's not only how we train people to think, to be able to be critical problem solvers, think through you know, complex scenarios, but I think there's a war fighting and a readiness aspect to what they do. We have to train them and think about problems to do what. So the to do what piece is I think where ACC is really going to make a lot of money. For example, the deployed combat wing. Having to actually go and deploy as a wing, I don't think we have a 3-1 on that. And, and being able to force protect, and how do I actually, under attack, still be able to generate forces? All these missions are happening simultaneously, and there still needs to be a certification and verification process, and I think that's where, again, ACC comes back and, and makes their money into all of it. But again, when you go back to the different MAGCOMs, I, I don't want to negate that AMC or Global Strike or AFSOC have any less of a responsibility. I think that Global Strike is going to be ready for a very different type of mission, so there's going to have to be training that Global Strike does internally, and there's going to have to be things that AFSOC does to be ready for SOCOM missions that are very different from the Global Strike mission. But again, this unit of action in the deployable combat wing, I think there's a big ACC piece to this that they're going to have to pick up a lot of the, the readiness load. Did that answer your question? Thanks. Hi, Tobias Nagley, Air and Space Forces Magazine. I'm curious if you could explain how uh, the force design might evolve if you don't get in gas. How it might evolve. I, so I think what it does is it challenges the way that we would actually execute in a mission area one or a mission area two or a mission area three. I'm not just going to put it in one bin. I think what it does is, you know, I mentioned before that the design gives that North Star about the things that we need to do, the key operational problems that we would need to solve and a framework for thinking about it. 
there's probably multiple force structures. Some of them may not include NGAD, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's less about the platform and more about the systems and how they're coming together and how do you actually replicate the effect of what that system would have in a mission area one or a mission area two. Uh, to that extent, I would tell you that from the NGAD point of view, that th there's lots of ways that I think you can actually achieve air superiority. But again, I'm gonna go back to the chief's point, in order to do what? Even in a mission area one scenario, in a high threat scenario, I'd have to question when would I use it and how would I use it? Does, 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 that, does that mean that you would need those capabilities in some other form? And so you, it, that has to be a trade. If I don't get that, I have to have these. Yeah, so remember I had the, I was giving, trying to visually describe what maybe four overlapping Venn diagrams might look like. If, if I had all my eggs in the NGAD basket, but I had nothing or very little, in a in a next generation refueler, that that's problematic. And I had nothing in a base defense piece, that's problematic. And I had very little. It, it's not an all or nothing game. This can't. This has to be a portfolio type approach. And I think the numbers of it matter. If you're going to overinvest in one area, then I need to take see where I'm going to be taking hits from. And I think this is where the mission areas and what that threat looks like, the density of that threat and what it calls for, actually matter. There could be a time when I want to actually invest more into counter C5 ISRT and some space capability and maybe less into some of the other three. So I think there is a framework here that we're trying to describe that helps us be fiscally informed about what capabilities we want and to how many the quantity of that. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, General. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grant Rajoulis. I'm the Air Force fellow here at the Mitchell Institute. Um, my question today is about um, your, what you see with regards to air battle management. Um, as we look at the Pacific and, and writ large, the, the majority of the force to be able to counter anything, uh, any threat that, that could pop up, um, we know that we haven't had to fight an air-to-air -air conventional war in a very long time. And so as we talk about the force that we have today and being able to fight with what we have, um, and then also as we move towards a TIPI-4 talk enabled TRC and then the, uh, the onboarding of the E-7, how do you see that kind of shifting uh, from you know, what we can do with an E-3 uh, CRC uh, combo and how that's going to complement the force and then kind of what we're doing, looking at in the future with those new programs? Yeah, I think you're at the heart of the question, and let me just paraphrase it, is it, as I see this more as the battle management aspect of it, right? And then the battle management piece and, and how are we evolving to tomorrow's battle management system, specifically when you're talking about the AVMers, is that correct? So I would offer this, that in, in this highly dense threat, uh, I don't think things, uh, there used to be a way that we would force package uh, things in there and it had an AWACS and it would have tankers and it would have uh, other sensors and ISR platforms and you would have your, uh, your defensive counter air, you would have jamming, you would have all these things that you would force package together. I think when you start looking at this environment now, the highly contested environment, what you're going to be doing is something a little bit more akin, and I even hate to use the example, but a little bit more akin to the CENTCOM model where it's crowdsourced. You're going to be pulling data from multiple areas and it has to be fed into a common area, into a common picture. I think this is where apertures matter for aircraft. I could probably battle manage from a lot of different platforms. As a matter of fact, our vice chief says, you know, if we could just be a little bit less focused on the prefix of whatever the number of an aircraft is, you know, I might be able to find that I could do lots of things with different capabilities. There's no reason if with the right apertures, I couldn't put an air battle manager on a KC-46, or I can't have a team on the ground with a TACP and an air battle manager working at top light. And then what does that construct look like? As long as I'm executing the functions of battle management, being underpinned by communications, which I think is the long pole in the tent, I think we already know how to do the battle management piece pretty well. It's how do we distribute it out? How does that distributed control layer that we always talk about, how does that come together? And I would tell you that's going to come together in a, in a crowdsourced manner in which you're going to see air battle managers on non-traditional platforms. You may see them on the ground, and you may see them eventually into an E-7 or, or some sort of airborne system that, that used to do what the AWACS did before for us or still does what the AWACS does for us now. So all of that coming together, I think that yeah, battle management is still a critical component of what we do. It's the reason why we have the ABMS team. They broke down the functions of battle management. And then the next part is, how do I connect them? So Luke Cropsey and the work that he's doing on C3BM, you know, I, I would argue that command, that, that for command control communication, command is the easy part. 
control is the hard part. <clears throat> so for us, the control piece is, you know, on a typical army doctrine, you have a left flank, you have a right flank, you have a thistle. And what they want is the most amount of airspace they possibly can to be able to integrate and put as much fires as they can, but they have to be able to deconflict it. That deconfliction piece ties into the communication architecture, which is why Luke and his team are working on that communications piece of this first to be able to enable future battle management. Did that answer it? Thank you. I refuse to believe that I have explained this with clarity, that you all are not asking me enough questions right now. All right, so in the meantime, what I'll tell you is that one, the, the work of for force design is still ongoing, but I do think, A, we have a good framework. The mission area structure for this actually makes sense. It makes sense in multiple ways, operationally on how we employ the force, but fiscally, in what we want to actually put together by way of systems to be effective. And then as we think about the world today, whether it's uh, Israel, Iran, Ukraine, Russia, Hamas, Gaza, any of that, as increased high, or high density threat areas emerge, we have to take a look at each one of those, be threat informed and understand what we're putting in there. What I don't want to do is at one given time, tell an airman, sorry, we don't have that capability for you and it's not ready yet. You have to go out and figure it out on your own. We have clever airmen that can do this all day long, but uh, but it's my job and the team's job to be able to get them the, the war winning capabilities they need. So with that, I'll tell you thank you. Appreciate the time today and appreciate the Mitchell Institute for hosting us for this forum. Thanks again.